to Unity Presbyterian Church online. This week in worship, Pastor David continues the series on disciples with a look at the devotion of Mary Magdalene. Let's listen. Facebook the other day, and a feature on there is called Facebook Memories. I, I really enjoy that feature because it will show you something that you posted on that exact day but usually from several years earlier. And so I like to check those out. You know, I kind of go down memory lane a little bit. And one thing that I saw, it was a picture from 16 years earlier. And I thought to myself, wow, I had Facebook 16 years ago? I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> but okay. Uh, but here's the picture that caught my attention. I, I want to share that with you. So this is a, a mission trip that I led to Mexico. And what's fun about these old pictures is I get to remember what was life like back then. You know, what was life like for me 16 years ago? And also, what has changed? What has changed in my life, the big life events? But what has also changed kind of within me from who I was then to who I am now? Well, here's a, a couple of examples. 16 years ago, I wasn't married yet. I wasn't married to Sarah. That would happen the following year. Uh, 16 years ago, I was leading a church youth group during the summer, but I was still a student in college preparing for my senior year. 16 years ago, I thought that a buzz cut was a good haircut. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but okay, we change, right? And now I look at myself and go, I, much has changed. I'm obviously graduated. I'm now married, have three kids. I'm pastoring a church in, in North Carolina. Uh, but I would encourage you this week, it's a fun exercise, go find an old picture. An old picture of 5, 10, 15 years ago, and, and look at that picture and say, okay, who was I then? How did I see the world? And how have I changed in that, the, the time since that picture was taken? You see, we're exploring the lives of the early disciples to see what can we learn from them that will affect how we walk our road of discipleship today. And today's disciple, if they looked back on a photo of their life, they would have seen a significant change occur. Uh, to this point, we have focused on some of the, the prominent disciples from Jesus's inner 12. Uh, we've looked at Peter, We've looked at John, we've looked at Judas, but Jesus' disciples were not limited to the twelve, nor were they limited to only men. So today, we're going to study a disciple from outside the twelve disciples, and her name was Mary, and she had a transformative experience in her life. She first appears in the Gospel of Luke, in a section where Luke is describing all the people who are following Jesus. It's early in Jesus' ministry, and she's describing this is the group, or Luke's describing this is the group that is following Jesus and is eager to learn from him about how to be disciples. What you'll see in this scripture text is that that includes the 12 disciples, but that it also includes many women. Luke chapter 8 begins this way. Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, so that's the twelve disciples, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. So Luke highlights three women out of the many other women who were following Jesus, and first on that list is Mary. Mary is the first one that Luke highlights. She was from the town called Magdala, which is where she got her last name, Magdalene. I've got a picture that shows you the map of Magdala that will get up on the screen behind me. At least I think we will. There it is. And so you can see the Sea of Galilee is right there in the middle. And then on the left side is Magdala, just north of Tiberias. That's where Mary was from. And that's where a lot of Jesus's ministry occurred. 
Now, fun fact, Magdala was known for its dried fish industry. Makes sense, right? Being right there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, that really, that fact has nothing to do with the rest of the sermon, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> In my research, I was like, I want to share that. Okay, dried fish, go to Magdala. Very interesting. But most important is not where Mary was from. Most important is the reason why she chose to follow Jesus. At some point in her life, Mary was deeply afflicted. Luke reports that she was possessed by seven demons. Now, anytime you see that number seven, in the Bible, it should catch your attention. Because you can interpret it in one of two ways. It could be interpreted literally as the number seven, or also seven often meant completion. It, it meant, it was a symbol to say that seven is, is this perfect, complete kind of number. And so it may be that as Luke is writing this, he's not so concerned with the amount of demons that were in Mary, but instead, what he's trying to say is she was in complete suffering. Mary was in complete distress. She was at her lowest low in this moment. And to make matters worse, in this time period, uh, if people had an ongoing disease that the medical professionals did not know how to fix or heal, then the diseased person were ostracized. They were asked to, to leave the community to say, we don't know how to handle you, but we don't want to get what you have. And so we're going to ask you to live away from us. This would have been Mary's situation, which means that when Jesus met her, she would have been in complete suffering, cut off from her community and those that she loved. But Jesus healed her. In an instant, her life changed because of Jesus. And her life was now free from all affliction. So if she would have looked back on a Facebook memory from the time that she was in complete suffering to the time when all of a sudden she was healed, she would have seen complete transformation in her life. What do you think she did with that newfound freedom? When she was healed for the first time in so long, what do you think she did? Well, she followed Jesus, of course. How could you not after what Jesus just did for you? And so she followed the one who is directly responsible for changing her life for the better. Yes, Mary is a part of this group of women who all appear to have been healed in some way by Jesus. Now, before we go further, we cannot understate the fact that Luke includes these women at all in his gospel. In this time period, in the Greco-Roman world, uh, women were considered second-class citizens. They had very little power and very little authority in wider society. And so it is pretty revolutionary that Jesus invites both men and women to be his disciples, because in doing so, he is strongly pushing back against the patriarchal system in which he finds himself. Now, get this. Not only were women disciples of Jesus, following Jesus, but they were also funding his ministry. This is what Luke shares with us in the next verse. It says, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Yes, it is thought that these women, these three, were listed out of the group of the many women that were following Jesus because they had considerable means. And they were using those means to support Jesus and to support his ministry. They were literally funding the mission of Jesus in the world. How neat is that? And so Mary Magdalene is one of those people that followed Jesus and was learning from Jesus over the course of several years. Now, I want to fast forward a little bit because Mary is not as highlighted as the other disciples until an event towards the end of Jesus' life. You may remember that when Jesus was crucified, the majority of disciples abandoned him. The majority of disciples fled for fear and seeking their own safety. But a group of women stayed with Jesus. 
A group of women stayed at the foot of the cross even when Jesus was being crucified. And Mary, in particular, is singled out for her role because of what she does with Jesus' body after it's taken down from the cross. So that's the story I want to pick up on now. So after Jesus, is, Jesus dies, this happens. We're told Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So two men come for Jesus' dead body. It is Joseph and it is Nicodemus. Now you might remember the story of Nicodemus. You can read about it in John chapter 3, but we highlight him because he was a chief priest. He was a member of the Jewish ruling elite, the same group that has now put Jesus to death. But early on, he secretly goes out. And at night, he wants to meet with Jesus. He does it secretly because he doesn't want anyone else to know that he might actually believe this. He might actually believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the same conversation where Jesus says to him, if you want to follow me, you must be born again. So that's Nicodemus as he has learned to follow Jesus. And then there's Joseph of Arimathea. And we're told in another gospel that he's also one of the chief priests, and that he also has come to be a secret disciple of Jesus. Joseph and Nicodemus, after Jesus has died, they are choosing to be secret no longer. Now, the bodies of those who were crucified were often not given proper burial. They were left to to hang on on the cross and rot, or sometimes those bodies were cut down and just kind of left to the, the animals or the scavengers. But Joseph and Nicodemus, who'd been in the background to this point, they decide to come out of the shadows. They go directly to Pilate, and they ask for Jesus' body. Since they were members of the Jewish ruling elite, they had the status. They had the authority to be able to ask for the body, something none of the other disciples had. And Pilate gives them permission. Here's what happens next. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen, This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Okay, Jesus died right before the Sabbath. This was a Friday that Jesus died. And from the time that Jesus died to sunset on the Sabbath, these two Jewish men who still observed the Sabbath, they would have had about three hours to get Jesus' body ready for burial. And you can see that they've come prepared, haven't they? They've come prepared with 75 pounds of myrrhs and aloes and spices. And over those three hours, they gently and delicately prepare Jesus' body to be buried. This would have involved washing the body cleaning the wounds, applying the myrrhs and and aloes, and then when you're ready, wrapping the body in this fresh linen. And then finally, when that process was done, these would be the two men who would then take Jesus' body and lovingly place it in the tomb. We learn from another gospel that, that Joseph of Arimathea, this was his family's tomb, and it was cut right into the stone. Uh, imagine the act of generosity of this man giving up his family tomb for this person, Jesus, whom he secretly had been following for some time. By that time that Jesus is laid to rest, nobody else is still around. I mean, the sun is setting, 
It's about to be the Sabbath. Everyone is gone at this point. Well, almost everyone. Because while this is happening, this is what we're told. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. Yes, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are the last two disciples to remain after the crucifixion. After everyone else has left, they've gone home. They couldn't handle any more to see this disastrous day. Mary remains. The theme of the day, the word that I want you to pick up on when we study Mary's life, is the word devotion. Imagine the devotion it would have taken to witness all that she witnessed that day with the, the torturing and eventual death of a person that she loved so deeply, a person who changed her life, a person that she believed was the Messiah, to see all of that happen and to still be one of the last two people to remain and watch where he is buried. That's an incredible amount of devotion. And yet it makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus was there for Mary at her lowest moment. When Mary was dealing with complete suffering, when she was ostracized from her community, Jesus was there for her. And now, when the tables are turned, and when Jesus is in his lowest moment, Mary is not going to leave his side. When we study the story of Mary, what we see is a person who went from complete suffering to complete devotion. Now, we are meant to apply this and her story to, to our lives because we're disciples today. We're disciples, it's 2,000 years later, but we are still called to follow Christ. And so what is our, our takeaway from this story? And one that really stood out to me as I studied Mary's life this week was this. I, I believe that Mary encourages us to live with this same utmost devotion and dedication to Christ. Be the kind of disciple that's willing to take an extra step on your journey of discipleship. I mean, think about Mary. She did not have to stay at the tomb after Jesus was buried, but she wanted to. Her love for God would not allow her to leave the tomb. And it makes me wonder, how can we imitate this same sort of devotion with our lives? I mean, how can we respond to the love of God with this same sort of complete dedication? Well, guess what? Mary's story is not quite over. Because Mary was so devoted that she alone returns to the tomb at the earliest opportunity. So again, the Sabbath would have been Friday night to Sunday morning. So Mary is there watching the tomb as the sun goes down on a Friday night. And then she goes home. And she spends all of Friday, all of Saturday, up till Sunday morning at home. But as soon as it's dark on Sunday morning, and as the sun is just beginning to crest, she goes to the tomb. Her devotion is so strong that it leads her right back to the tomb, knowing what she's going to find. Knowing that it's just going to be Jesus' body. And she won't be able to even see the body because it's behind this stone that she watched being rolled up to block the tomb. But her devotion is so strong that all she wants to do is be there, be around the tomb, be in the presence of Christ. And so we're told that early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the, went to the tomb and saw something that surprised her. She saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So, who went to the tomb? It wasn't Peter. Peter didn't go to the tomb. It wasn't John. John didn't go to the tomb. Mary. Mary alone went to the tomb out of her profound devotion for Christ. Which means that she is the first one, the first disciple who is able to see the empty tomb. She's the first disciple who eventually realizes, not yet, but eventually, that Jesus is risen. 
Yes, Mary is not the kind of disciple who's just going to do the bare minimum. She is committed to Christ, even when she believes that he is gone. Now, here's what happens next. When she discovers that the stone has been rolled away, she doesn't go in. She runs. She runs to go tell Peter what she has discovered. And then she eventually works her way back to the garden. And at this moment, she sees the stone rolled away, but she doesn't know that Jesus has risen. She thinks someone has just stolen the body. And so she's standing outside this empty tomb, and she is weeping. I imagine her just bleary-eyed, completely distraught, and someone approaches her from the side. She believes that person not really paying attention must be the gardener. And this is what happens. It says that this, at the person approaching, she turned and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. I will get him. I will go and care for that body. I will get him. But Jesus simply said to her, Mary. And if you continue reading, what you'll find out is that the moment Jesus says her name is the moment her eyes are opened. The moment she realizes this is not the gardener, this is Jesus, who is risen, who is now speaking to me here. She is now the first one to see the risen Christ out of all of her disciples. What I take that to mean is that her deep devotion to God, it really is richly rewarded because Mary became then one of the first who could then share the news. She's the first evangelist saying Jesus is risen and let me spread that great news. Here's what I think all this means. When God sees us as fully devoted dedicated disciples, I believe that God honors that. God will use any faithfulness that you present to God for God's greater purposes. And if that is true, then let us all be like Mary, someone who is fully devoted to Christ. Amen. If you would like more information about Unity Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at www.unitypres.org or visit us on Facebook. This is the Unity Presbyterian Church Podcast. Have a great week.